Uh, welcome, everybody. Welcome to our breakout session on advocacy. I'm so pleased to see you. I know that last session went super quickly, and this one's going to go fast as well. So let's dive right in. I am Darcy Hirsch. I am JFNA's Director of Government Affairs. I'm also the Washington representative for the Network of Jewish Human Service Agencies. I am so pleased to be with you with my colleague, Nancy Volpert, the Director of Public Policy and Strategic Initiatives at JFS LA, and I am going to turn it over to Nancy. Hi, everybody. Thank you for joining us for, for the conversation. I'm going to try not to speak as fast as I did last time, but it's, I will say it's really hard to do this in 20 minutes. So please, 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 um, if you have questions, at least type them in the chat. Darcy and I will do our best to um, do it. And if not, feel free to reach out to me separately. Um, two seconds, Jewish Family Service LA. We've been around since before the Civil War, we, uh, 1854. We came with the gold rush in LA and we provide a range of services, mental health, serving older adults, responding to hunger and supporting survivors of domestic violence among others across the LA County region. And we are, inspired by our the Jewish values that helped found our work. Um, so I know yesterday uh, in, during the session and this morning, we had a little bit about um, how we, what's our Jewish commitment to fighting poverty and fighting Jewish poverty. Because I'm a West Coast person, I, I liked this piece from Rabbi Artson, who is at the American Jewish University. He wrote, wrote a piece called Walking with Justice um, in which he, he talks about, you must not remain indifferent. And I really love that perspective uh, when we talk about the Jewish values that help inspire the work we do. You know, I'm sure some of you like the piece around sharing your bread with the hum hungry. There are a lot of things we can look to from our, our texts and from our values to talk about the work we do to help fight poverty. You know, one of the questions that we get asked is really what role does the government play in addressing economic insecurity? And I know that uh, this is a piece that the Jewish Funders Network has been looking at, but I also know that when we talk about it, we talk about really the critical importance of philanthropy but there is no way that private philanthropy can address the problem of poverty and economic security on its own. It is, it's a massive problem and there's no, you have to have government interventions in order to really address what's going on. So what are some of the places where the government plays a role in reducing poverty? And you know, this is really kind of a macro view of where our, where we need to have influence around policy and advocacy if we want to address systemic uh, poverty and structural inequities that are truly um, woven, unfortunately, throughout our, our, our structures and that we have seen brought into unfortunate light during the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. A lot of people have talked, um, at least in the circles I run in, that the structural inequities have always been there, but unfortunately the last seven months have really brought them into stark relief in a much broader way to a much larger audience. So there's a whole alphabet soup of programs that government funds, oversees, implements, and designs that go to helping those who are living in poverty uh, regain economic self-sufficiency school breakfasts, senior lunches, Meals on Wheels, Medicaid, um, Social Security, Supplemental Security Income. There are a range of alphabet soups that we could talk about. I will skip that if people are interested. We can have a conversation offline about, there's really a whole range of pro programs that we could talk about. Um, but you know, we can also look at it a little differently. And for me, this structure of what's called a problem tree is just, it's a different way of looking at the same problem. And I will, I will admit that this is a fairly simplistic 
list of causes and consequences. Um, we could spend many hours and many months talking about this, but I really just wanted to give you guys a different view on the same problem that we're talking about and really just illustrate for me um, the point in the corner, which is when you're talking about advocacy, advocacy looks at how do you address the policies that underlie these causes that cause the problem that lead to the negative consequences. So that if we can do advocacy and policy work, we can help address the systemic causes. And really, if you address things at the root level, roots, trees, you know, hey, it's, it's a Monday, no, Tuesday, um, but that you can have a much broader impact, right? Same work. It, it's the same amount of work for me to do advocacy at the state and change a policy that helps address senior meals for 100,000 seniors in the state as it is for me to do the work in the city, which helps you know, 10,000 or to provide meals to 1,000. So if I can make the systemic change, then we can make an even bigger impact. Um, Darcy, what's my what's the ending time for us today? Is it 1040? Yes. Okay, sorry. Just trying to keep track of my time. So one of the questions that was asked for me today is to address today is why has JFS had success in its policy and advocacy work? And what are some of the things that we think are important for all of you to consider as you make investments uh, hopefully to address poverty and Jewish poverty? And what are the kinds of things that within your organizations you can replicate and that can help lead to additional success? I will also say you're, you're gonna hear me talking consistently around poverty at large, because when you're talking about policy issues, you're talking about the policies that address uh, poverty for all populations. You may pick a particular group of those policies, workforce issues, hunger issues, um, income support issues, uh, conversation for another day around universal basic income as a potential concept. Um, so, but the policies are non-denominational. And so I, I am bringing them all together in the same conversation. So we've had success, number one, we've built the structures internally to support our policy and advocacy work. And the question was asked last session, what are those structures? And the most important structure is piece of the structure is the foundation. The foundation is that our work, my work, has buy-in and participation from the JFS board of directors and from our CEO and executive leadership team. Um, there is a board level committee chaired by a board member, participation by the board chair, that is our public policy committee with whom that I staff and that provides input and guidance on our policy at, at work throughout the year. Our board members are willing to use their contacts and their connections uh, on behalf of JFSLA. It took some time to get them more comfortable with it, but our community, our board members are community leaders who have a lot of other um, connections and contacts and things that they do outside of JFS. And we like leveraging those on our behalf as well. The second piece of it is there's an incredibly deep partnership that I have and that my, my, my colleague on my team has with our program staff. The work that we do is guided by the work that we do um, for our clients and the services that we provide. Next piece is, and the, the, the third of sort of the big three pieces is that we have a designated staff person. Um, that's me. And I will tell you, and Darcy has heard this, um, there is a, a misperception by, by other people that I spend full time on policy and advocacy work. And while I wish that were the case, um, it hasn't been my only assignment at JFS in more than a decade. And so we, the fact is that what's important is that it's a designated person more so than it's a full-time person um, because you can do a lot with, 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 with a little. Um, 
And we also do a concurrent focus on local, state, and federal issues, and we look at regulations and legislation. So we're doing going in a lot of directions at once. Um, and so we're doing the work. Let's see, there it is, right? So once you have the structures, then you can do the work to be effective. And if you take no other piece from this slide, then 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 the following comment, then whoops then it's this, build the relationships when you don't need them. So you have them and you have the credibility when you do need them. You want, you want to become a resource in your community for your legislators. And, and I'm using legislators, staffers, elected officials to mean whether it's your city council members, your county supervisors, your state representatives, your congressional representatives. None of these things that I'm talking about change. Um, and if it's, it, and I see to someone from Toronto, welcome Canada. <laughs> um, but these, no, all of this is the same for you as well. The structures are, are slightly different, but the basics about relationship building and being credible, right? Know what you know and understand what you don't know. So it's okay to say to people, um, if you're talking to staffers, that you don't know something or it's not your area of expertise and turn them over to somebody else. It's better to do that, in fact, than to either than to spend time on things you don't actually know. Because part of being credible is being able to say, that's not my area of expertise or that's not my agency's expertise. Let me find somebody else who does or can. You want to invite people to legislative staffers and legislators to serve on your committees, participate in your programs, invite them to your sites. Um, you, you wanna know that staffers generally are looking at constituent needs, capital staffers generally are looking at policy expertise and you know, elected officials want to connections to community leaders who by the way, again, are your lay leaders. And you can, you can become a resource without having to do significant additional work. You already have expertise at your agency or in, with your partners. And so leverage that. The other piece, and I, I forgot to say this before is, um, right, so you look at the outcome of this. This is my, one of my, you know, my proud days is we opened a new pantry and we had legislators from all across. But if you look at the, person, that's our city, current city attorney, right? He was a city council member, then he became a state assembly member. Now he's our city attorney. And we had a relationship with him from city council. And when he went to the state, we were able to build on that relationship so that he was able to help us with a state issue because he already knew us. Yeah, you know, he was a city council member before he was a county supervisor. He was a county he was a state assembly member before a city council member. She was a staffer for a city, state senator before she became an elected official. It's all very incestuous. Um, okay, I have, whoops. I have two minutes left. Um, so I wanna just mention the third piece that makes this possible in addition to having the structures in place and doing the work to be effective is that you need to build partnerships. Um, we in this, this group and in this network are incredibly fortunate to have partners in DC through, you know, Darcy and I work together on a regular basis. JFNA and NJHSA are really critical and we rely on them. I don't need to be expert in everything. I just need to know who the expert is, right? I don't have to know everything in DC. I have Darcy and the team at JFNA to know that. So use them to leverage your work. The other piece is that Jewish Federation of Greater LA and I work really closely together. We advocate together, we do relationship building together, we do jo joint programming, we've done several Zooms during, during this, but we, we started doing that three years ago. Um, and we've been able to do that uh, to our mutual benefit and to the benefit of our greater community. Last but not least, we don't really have time to talk about it, but I, I can't talk up to people right now without at least mentioning voter engagement. 
Um, if you are eligible to vote and you are in the US and have not yet voted, please vote. Participation matters. Who is in office um, matters to how we can address the issues that are our priorities. And not just big um, overwhelming elections like the one next week, and really the November 3rd is the last day to vote, but it's your local elections, your local representatives. You wanna get people participating in every election. Um, because school boards, city council, state representatives, it all really, really matters. Um, I know there's questions coming in and there's like three minutes. So with that, I will take a breath, say thank you. Um, thank you for joining us and Darcy. Thank you so much, Nancy, for this um, speedy overview of effective advocacy and why it's so critical to, to your work in combating poverty. I, I actually think I, I tried to address a lot of the questions in the chat while you were while you were talking. Um, but Jessica Melman asked if you if you partner with non-Jewish organizations. And I, I said that you do work in coalition. Can you give some examples of, of your work with non-Jewish partners? Sure. Um, we do, uh, uh, I would say the majority of our partnerships are in the broader community, including things depending like justice and aging and the A and AARP and the uh, at Los Angeles Aging Advocacy Coalition when it's talking about uh, aging issues. We are part of the National Network to End Domestic Violence, the California Partnership to End Domestic Violence and others when it comes to addressing uh, DV issues. Uh, we work in coalition with a number of organizations in Los Angeles around uh, healthcare and healthcare access, and a number of those issues around uh, mutual areas of interest for advocacy. Um, you know, you can partner with AARP, uh, Chambers of Commerce, all kinds of other organizations. Let them do the work and you can come along rather than um, reinventing what they're already doing while you, while you build that. Um, can I show the tree slide again? Yes, I think so. <laughs> I say that. I'm not 100% sure, but hold on. I also, um, I, I'm not sure if, um, I, I'm, I, you can also email me afterwards and I'm happy to, to send anybody my slides who wants them. Um, yeah. And I'm, I'm keeping notes of, of, of requests as well. Okay, sorry, there's, oh, there we go. Here's my tree slide. Um, okay. Any uh, last questions before we release you to your lunch break? Okay. <laughs> well, we're gonna we're gonna leave this slide up just for a couple minutes. But um, with that, I, if there are no other questions, I just I want to thank you all for joining us. I want to thank Nancy so much for. Um, her incredible presentation and doing it so quickly. Uh, we weren't able to take a deep dive, but we covered so much information in 20 minutes. Um, and I know the slide will be a great resource to all of you as you engage in this work moving forward. Um, so just a reminder, uh, the lunch break is until 2.10 Eastern, 11.10 Pacific. And uh, I hope you can get outside, take a little walk around your office or your living room. And uh, we look forward to seeing you in about 30 minutes.